Hey, it's all with an end game gearing guide. Although, okay, or maybe this is a guide to answer the question of where the heck is gear in patch 9.1? Be sure to subscribe to this channel for more guides and all things Warcraft. This guide also assumes that you're fairly familiar with Shadowlands content. Also keep in mind that what you may learn here may be different on live servers. Gearing has changed a lot in this patch because now we have some pretty clear paths to gearing unlike in the past. For example, in 9.0 of Shadowlands, the meta way to gear was basically to run rated PvP until you got gear and then you run off to do whatever it is that you actually want to do. And if you played outside of the big three, that is organized raids or Mythic Plus or rated PvP, there was not much gearing going on at all. There will be a lot you can do now in this patch, and it might be a little confusing because the meta is a bit less obvious this time around. So this guide will be sectioned off into numerous categories that you can check out using the navigation bar somewhere below. So that said, I'm going to gloss over kind of a lot of things like the 9-0 Covenant campaign because Blizzard really wants to funnel players into the latest content, which isn't such a bad thing. If you're jumping in during this first week of 9.1, you're in for a special period called the preseason. It's the brief time period with the most player overlap, regardless of what your idea of endgame is. Once the season begins, players will be zipping off to the end game or end games that they care about the most. But for now, let's talk you through the intro of 9.1 and what most everyone is going to be doing each week. You'll first visit Orbos and pick up a quest to begin this Chains of Domination campaign. Over the next few weeks, you'll want to keep an eye out for new quests as they appear once you meet the renowned requirements. You can use your handy dandy covenant button over here to take a look at where you're at. Shortly into the campaign, you'll unlock the new zone, Corthia. The campaign will also change the Maw from an unwelcoming zone dominated by the Jailer's forces to a zone under constant occupation from Covenant forces in various places. After unlocking this the first time, you should have the ability to skip this introduction on your alts, so it'll be easy to get all of them started right away. I can't say for sure if all of these events will happen during the preseason, or if it's going to start in season 2, but I'll mention them here just in case. There will be Covenant Assaults that occur on an identical schedule as the Old God Assaults from Patch 8.3, as shown here. You'll want to complete these assaults each time that they're up, which is twice a week, and they're pretty fun to do, and it's pretty cool to fight alongside your counterparts. At the end of each assault, you'll get some pretty cool and helpful rewards, including gear that starts at an item level of 200. But for progression-minded players who want a higher item level, Soul Cinders, which are used for crafting higher level legendaries. Completing these throughout the week will score you 100 of these Cinders. Also, roughly every hour, a random event will occur called the Tormentors of Torghast. It's similar to the Wrath of the Jailer event, where, you know, bad guys spawn and you kill them until a bigger bad guy spawns, and then you get more rewards and more gear and more goodies. This Torghast-themed event also drops, among other things, Soul Cinders. Complete this once a week for another 50 Cinders. Speaking of other things, gear that drops in the Maw and Corthia are upgradable. They start at an item level of 200, but they can be upgraded all the way to 233 after investing some time and resources into them. I'll have more on that later, because the value of this gear depends on who you are. Now you might be thinking, ah, screw it, that's not even equal to heroic raid gear, but consider holding on to weapons and trinkets which you might be interested in. I'm going to throw these up on screen for you to pause and, you know, check out for your viewing pleasure. There's no telling if or when a decent weapon or trinket is going to drop, so when one does, I would advise holding on to it for a rainy day. Now let's move on to your first visits to Corthia. Corthia revolves around a bunch of dailies and side content like treasures and rares and events. What will bring most players here though is this weekly quest, Shaping Fate, that awards a big chunk of anima, a box of goodies, the Stygian embers, maybe some of that gear, and renown. In 9.1, the quest to save souls from the Maw no longer grants renown at all. That precious honor has moved here to this quest in Korthia instead. So at the start of each week, you're going to get into the habit of picking up the anima gathering quest from your sanctum because that will once again earn you renown, then pick up the weekly quest in Korthia and knock that out. The quest itself is basically an activity quest, similar to Mechagon. You just kill rares and complete dailies and open up treasures in the Maw and Korthia. 
you fill this bar up and you're good for the week. This can be completed in one sitting and will have you walking away with a lot of useful stuff, as I said. Tuesdays in Corthia and the Maw are going to be a really big nexus for player activity, with big groups of people knocking out their weekly content all in this really condensed set of areas, which are the Covenant-controlled areas of the Maw and the mid-sized zone in Corthia. There may be daily quests in Corthia as early as the first week that award an item called a Corthite Crystal. These are needed by crafters to make a Vestige of Origins, a reagent to make these rank 5 and rank 6 legendaries. It's going to be a while before these start popping up, but if these crystals can be obtained, start hoarding or selling them right away. Crafters need a whopping 40 of these, according to the PTR, meaning during the early weeks of the patch, this is definitely going to be a seller's market. If you have plenty of alts, you can have all of your alts hang out in Corthia and then see if they have one of those daily quests for crystals. If they do, sweet, go get it. This is something that you may want to consider habitually doing like forever, or at least until the prices of these crystals stabilize. Torghast is not going to be fully accessible during the preseason. In a post, we learned that Layer 10 is going to open up with the start of Season 2, so there's no telling, or at least we're not sure, if we're going to be stuck on Layer 8 at, on Day 1 of the patch, or if we can at least access Layer 9. But in total, we're going to get four more layers, and these four layers are where your remaining soul cinders are going to come from during your weekly farming. Without knowing all the information, I'm just going to suggest that you climb as high as you can if possible. Just like the lower floors, the higher floor unlocks are account wide. But this time around, instead of just clearing the floor successfully, you need to meet or beat a certain score. There's also a talent tree that you can unlock in Torghast called the Box of Many Things. Now you might be tempted to try farming Torghast in order to progress through this talent tree, but for now I advise against it. You have plenty of time to do this later. I'm not going to get too far into the details because frankly, unlocking the higher floors isn't very difficult at all. Just keep the following things in mind when farming Torghast for these soul cinders. Kill everything. Break everything. Save every soul. Don't die. I'm going to get into this more in a more in-depth Torghast guide. I realize that I'm going to repeat the following numerous times throughout this guide, so instead I'm just going to call this next series of statements that I'll say the chorus for you to refer back to throughout the guide. So here we go. Go pick up your weekly anima quest at the Covenant Sanctum for Renown. Pick up the weekly quest in Corthia. Clear the Maw and Corthia, that's going to mean all the dailies that you see, at least one round of rares and treasures if you find any, as well as the New World boss. Complete the Covenant Assault, Tormentors of Torghast event, and you should have completed all of your weekly quests. Check your alts for Corthite Crystal quests if crafting is important to you. Drop by the Maw again in the second half of the week for another Covenant Assault. Climb Torghast until you get all the cinders that you need and spend points on the box of many things so your future climbs are faster. If the time walking or mythic dungeon event appears, consider completing them for raid gear that may have a domination socket. So in case you're on a character that isn't very well geared at all, I would suggest that you stick around right now because we're about to start the first section on basic gearing and farming in Corthia Endgame. Otherwise, now that we've brushed on the details of what most players will be doing on their progression routine each week, we're going to branch off into the different flavors of Endgame, that is raiding, dungeons, PvP, or neither. We'll go over how all of it works and what you'll be doing to progress, so use that navigation bar below to jump around however you like. As someone playing outside of the big three, you're going to be embracing the Maw and Corthia as your uh, pretty much constant or usual destination zones. As soon as the second week of the patch, you'll have the opportunity to fly in the four covenant zones. Unfortunately, it doesn't include Corthia or the Maw, but at least it'll make completing covenant callings and world quests way easier. The same will go for your low level alts too. Refer to the weekly chorus for your starting routine, but for folks like us who solo and take things easy, the world is our content. Check out the Covenant Callings in case you're behind on Renown or for some extra reputation. Check out the World Quest rewards for some upgrades, especially as your Renown goes up and those rewards get stronger. Gearing and progressing in Corthia and the mod does mostly center on this upgradable gear that comes from rare drops and treasures and the events that I've been mentioning. 
Even the older Wrath of the Jailer event drops this year, making it another box for you to check. Just keep in mind that you get loot from it once a week, just like the Assaults and the Tormentors of Torghast. From my testing, I've seen this gear drop as high as an item level of 213, which is 3 out of the 6 possible upgrade levels, but all things considered, this is a really good start if you're trying to move into endgame. There's one additional source of this gear, and it's from this rep vendor who sells Corthian armaments, which also sometimes drop from rares and treasures and the like. It's account wide, and it costs a thousand Stygia. So at least early on, it's not really in your interest to spend your time farming Stygia, even if you can do it with impunity now. So how do you upgrade this gear from Corthia and the Maw? By questing in Corthia, you'll unlock a new faction called the Archivist Codex. It's managed by this NPC here, and he wants these things called Relic Fragments. Tons and tons of Relic Fragments. These are basically found in Corthia and are in all the familiar places, like daily quests and rares and treasures and even some mobs have them, and you'll eventually unlock a special tracker to see where they are. Turning in these fragments to this NPC does two things. It gets you reputation, which you want to access some cool rewards, and you're also given back a currency that you can spend, called Catalog Research, that you can use to spend it on items and, of course, to upgrade this gear found in Corthia and the Maw. These upgrades get progressively more expensive from rank to rank. This is pretty familiar. So for example, leveling just one rank one piece all the way to rank 6 costs a whopping 10,000 research. Fortunately, the costs aren't different per piece of gear, but that's still a lot. On top of that though, you need to unlock the ability to upgrade this gear to ranks 5 and 6, which means you need to build a reputation with the Archivist Codex and have a renown level of 75, which is definitely going to take a while. In the long run, this will probably work out. As you wrap up, there are perks to earn that'll let you obtain much more research by opening up more of the zone for exploration. For solo-minded players, this might be like ideal or just fine, but for raiders and others who are just looking for an additional path to obtaining gear on their, you know, climb to power, they'll probably be happy farming Corthia for gear to level maybe rank three or four at most, on top of of maybe farming Raid Finder before sort of graduating from what outdoor content can give them. And that's totally okay. Out of the domination shards that are pretty much only available for raiders, there is one shard that seems to be accessible outside of the raid, and it's this shard, which can be found from the world boss in Corthia. I'd say it's not terribly impressive, but if you want to make use of it for the bonus leech, you can slot this into a piece of domination gear that you can buy from either the Death's Advance Reputation or the Archivist Codex Reputation vendors. The piece of gear from the Archivist Codex vendor happens to be the highest single piece of gear a player at this level will get outside of legendary gear. So endgame Corthia farmers are going to go through the zone with a very fine-toothed comb over their 9.1 career, with longer-term rewards in mind. They'll also know the maw like frickin' the back of their hand. That's gonna be the primary difference between them and other endgame players who see Corthia as more of a stopover than their main content. On the journey towards their near heroic item level though, these people are going to run into a boatload of rewards including pets and transmog and mounts and achievements, as well as additional perks to help them feel a little bit more special, to help this feel like a mostly adequate endgame. As a byproduct of their work, there's also a lot of anima that they'll earn from questing, which should inject a little bit of life back into the Covenant Sanctum in case it's been neglected. Hello, hello, PvPers. Your folks routine isn't really going to change. Like you guys had it good in 9.0, at least when it comes to gearing and queuing up until you get into the elite gladiator range. The biggest change coming for PvP is the gear. All PvP gear is going to have two sorts of item level. So if you happen to be in full PvP gear and your average item level was 220, when you enter PvP combat, that item level jumps to 233. That means in PvP, you folks are going to have a maximum item level that is out of the reach of everyone else except for, of course, other people that are similarly geared to you. I didn't mention honor gear earlier in this guide because it's, frankly, it's not a great time investment. You'll get better starting gear from just hanging around Corthia, killing rares, and completing quests for gear in the 200 range without having to invest, like, a bunch of honor. So I suggest saving your honor for upgrading conquest gear and, at worst, replacement PvP trinkets if you're nearing the cap for whatever reason. 
Speaking of trinkets, there is a one-time quest called New Opportunities Wait by the Enclave in Oribos. It awards an on-use trinket that deals damage and absorbs heals, and it's a pretty nice start for starting trouble in Corthia. This item level change will have a few psychological effects on players, and maybe you too. The Race to World First will probably still contaminate arenas early on because, as usual, every advantage is worth taking. We don't know what they're going to do. But in the longer term, you'll probably find fewer players in queues as opposed to before, when a lot of progression-minded players they just dove into arenas for the sake of getting that high-end gear to take into raids or mythic plus. So here's the deal for PvPers. After you check your vault for rewards, take care of that normal weekly routine, the chorus. Refer back to that in case you forgot. Once that's done, pick up the weekly PvP quest for honor and conquest, and then enjoy the rest of the week, PvPing your face off and filling up the Great Vault and spending your honor as you near the cap. Start with that new trinket that you got and let the RNG take you where you need to next and, well, let the item level rain down on you. Hello Mythic Plus World and welcome to Season 2. This season is going to feel a little bit less about farming up Conquest gear, although if you're racing to get Keystone Master as fast as you can, well, you're probably at an item level of like, you know, the 225s or so anyway, so get started. This guide will be considering people that aren't quite at that level, so if you're not in that camp, follow along. At the time of this guide's writing, I don't have exact details on if you should be completing a certain key in order to get ahead on gear, because in earlier seasons, the first key that you would get is like four to five levels below your last key from the previous season, which led people to try and get into 20s in the last week so that their first key of season two in this case would be like a 15. But for now, let's set that thought aside. Mythic Plus folk, you're going to be looking at two sources of gear, your keys, and you'll also want to look at Tazavesh, the dungeon that also is going to open up uh, with the start of the season. Tazavesh is only playable in regular Mythic difficulty, and it drops item level 226 gear. However, it also includes a hard mode that when activated will drop 233 gear from its bosses. Wowhead has a guide on how to unlock the hard mode, which is going to require kind of some shenanigans if you want to access it on the first week. I'll provide a link in the description, but the major takeaway here is that every week, it's probably a good idea to do a clear of Tazavesh for the 226s or the 233s until until you've graduated from the instance. It'll also be worth getting a bit of practice in for the next season when the two halves of Tazavesh become mythic plus, so to speak. If you're totally anti-raid, your source of decent domination socketed gear, if you wanted it, is going to come from the mythic dungeon or the time walking weekly event that may award raid gear, which again could include this domination socket. As for acquiring shards, one is available from the world boss in Corthia, but your only recourse really maybe to just suck it up and run the raid finder version of the raid in hopes for shards, including probably this one, arguably the ideal one for Mythic Plus. Right now though, let's get back to Mythic Keystones. New to 9.1 is the Mythic Plus score, and to a lesser extent, Valor Points, which actually came in patch 905, but you probably forgot because you were already decently geared and didn't have, uh, and you didn't really care about Valor outside of alts. This time around, we get an opportunity to really see Valor shine, and for you to test out just how degenerate of a player you are, and, and you'll see what I mean in a bit. With an eye towards Keystone Master and the new Mythic Plus score tied to it, your gearing and progression is extremely straightforward, even if it might be a little rough to quickly explain. There are three major milestones for you to hit, at least with regards to gearing up. Keystone Explorer requires a score of 750. Keystone Conqueror requires 1500, and Keystone Master requires 2000 points. Let's make that our goal, and reaching these milestones will allow you to upgrade this uh, Mythic Dungeon gear uh, with Valor Points. You gain score by completing dungeons, and each dungeon has its own score based on how well you did on both the Tyrannical and the Fortified version, and all that gets smushed into a single rating per dungeon. You get more score by timing them, and obviously you get a higher key to run as a reward. You get less score if you fail a run, and of course your key depletes. But as long as you keep completing dungeons that are higher than the ones that you've completed before, your score is going to go up. 
That's the current calculation, which may change. It's just a warning. A popular sentiment going around is that you must time 15s of every dungeon on both Fortified and Tyrannical in order to get this new Keystone Master achievement, which is technically true. But according to the most current calculations, which again, this could change, so don't take my word for it, you could complete 16s of every dungeon on Fortified and Tyrannical. And by that, I mean, you can, you can miss time on every single one of those dungeons and you would qualify for Keystone Master all the same. At the moment, that's hypothetical. So let's focus on what you should do each week after checking your vault. So refer to that weekly chorus for the more routine activities. But on top of that, you'll want to clear Tazavesh each week, whether it's the normal or the hard mode version, until you're satisfied with the rewards. And then it's off to Keystones, although the mindset is going to be pretty different. There are two goals that you want to hit. One is very familiar. You're going to want to clear a 14 for the sake of getting the highest item level piece of gear from the Great Vault. The second is to find opportunities to raise your score. You might be used to feeling like, okay, you want to choose a, a dungeon that you know you can time, preferably a 15 because, you know, KSM. In 9.1 though, it's going to be more like choosing the dungeon that you know you can complete, not time necessarily, just complete. Clearing higher dungeons is arguably easier than timing a dungeon one or two levels down. Early in the season, this isn't going to matter. You're just going to be pushing keys, timing and not timing in this roller coaster of emotion. But as the season rolls along, you're going to step back and, you know, take a good look at your record to find the biggest opportunity to raise your score. Maybe there's a dungeon you haven't cleared at all with the fortified or tyrannical effects. Maybe you only cleared a halls 11, but you see on the group finder that, ooh, someone's hosting a 17 just for completion, and that's going to be a huge jump in score. Then you can use that elevated key next week and complete a bunch more keys for score, depleting said key as you go maybe. So like I said, it's very degenerate behavior, and this may not be possible, but hey, this is a gearing guide, right? And I'm just going to let you know what... I can let you know. As the weeks go by, you'll be sniping these certain dungeons that you need in order to get enough score for the keystone milestones of Explore, Conquer, and finally Master. In the meantime, collecting gear and hopefully some best in slot pieces that you can decide to you know, invest your valor into once you're able to upgrade that gear. A bit of social commentary here. In the short or maybe long term, you're going to see more and more players who are participating in Mythic Plus who are good enough to complete them, but may not be good enough to time or push. One could say that it dilutes the pool of skilled players, but we also have to consider what Blizzard is enabling by rewarding Keystone milestones this way. The way I see it, they just want more people to play, so I'm anxious to see how this all works out. Well, Raiders, preparing for the Sanctum of Domination, whether you're a cutting-edge destroyer of jailers or a puppy, it's going to be way more relaxed than previous seasons, with no artifact power shenanigans or mass farming in hopes of titan forging or corruption gathering. So let's start with the basics by first referring to the weekly chorus earlier in this guide. Unlike the revamps to PvP and Mythic Plus, Raiding didn't really add much, apart from the Shards of Domination, which I've covered very extensively in a separate guide, I'll provide a link somewhere. But in short, the Shards of Domination, the gear that you slot them into, all this stuff comes from the raid. It's a very circular loop that doesn't require much of any extra work at all. As you collect shards and gear and want to play with them, it'll be important to pick this up, the Soul Fire Chisel, which costs 2,500 or so Stygia. And if you're following the basic weekly routine, this shouldn't be a problem if you don't already have what you need. One small tip to add though, in case you're having trouble obtaining domination gear, you can rep up with the factions in Corthia. Reaching honor with the Death's Advanced Faction will get you a piece of Raid Finder gear with a domination socket. Being exalted with the Archivist Codex Faction will get you a heroic version of that gear, but that's gonna take a while. I wouldn't really worry about that. One of the strengths and weaknesses of raiding is that once the raid's done, that's it for the week. It sort of sucks, but it also gives raiders the highest likelihood to dip their toes into other content. So for example, maybe you've finished your raid. What else is there to do that contributes to your growth the most? If PvP fancies you, great. But I think that's not a great time investment unless you're racing to world first and well, even then. 
So first off, I would say go to Tazavesh. It's got gear that starts at with an item level of 226. And if you unlock the hard mode, that 226 becomes a 233 for the entire instance. And it might be fun, obviously. Your other route to gear would be to complete a plus 14 keystone for Great Vault gear. That's a really obvious one, pretty much a no brainer. But while I'm speculating here, I have a feeling that it's going to get much, much easier to get into higher level keys just for the sake of completion than ever before. Because with Mythic Plus, score, even dungeons that you don't clear count for credit. We don't know exactly how much they're going to count for because those calculations could change at any time, but I'm all but certain that there's going to be a pretty healthy population of people hosting these keys, and all you have to do is show up and not leave out of frustration. There's a reasonable chance that from gearing like this, you might get the Keystone Master by accident, but again, I could very much be wrong. Just keep in mind that you don't want to accidentally or wastefully replace Domination gear with Keystone gear when you don't really need to. So I'll repeat myself. For Raiders, after your routine, run a plus 14 for completion. Clear Tazavesh, preferably in hard mode, and of course, raid. And then, pretty much do what you want. <laughs> Somehow I forgot to include this info in the guide until post-production, so I'm going to talk about the likelihood of replacing legendaries during 9.1 for the sake of using this domination gear. Currently there are conflicts, and since legendaries can be crafted in multiple slots, players will do what's within their power, and are preparing to recraft the same legendaries for the sake of making room for this domination socketed gear. On the surface, this is an obvious design flaw, and would be easily solved by, I don't know, adding a way to disenchant our current legendaries for Ash, so we can use that to make new ones for 9.1. Which could also feel bad because what might happen in 9.2? Because as far as we know, traditional tier sets will be making a return as well. But let's look beyond just our player behavior and what we'll actually do when we make these higher ranked legendaries during 9.1. Let's pretend that I want to make a rank 5 legendary, and presume that Torghast and its 12 layers are fully unlocked. Making higher ranked legendaries needs soul cinders. To make or upgrade a legendary to rank 5, you need 400 of these cinders. To make or upgrade a legendary to rank 6, you need 1650 cinders, or 1250 if you're upgrading this from a rank 5. But notice I didn't say anything about soul ash, because soul ash is only needed if you're crafting a legendary from scratch. Ranks 5 or 6 don't cost any of this additional ash. I've been saying in this guide that you want to complete the Covenant Assaults, the Tormentors of Torghast event, and your two Torghast Climbs of Layer 12. This will get you 510 Soul Cinders, as well as 2060 Soul Ash per week. So let's just go all in with the most extreme situation. You want to craft a rank 6. To make a rank 6, you need 4 weeks worth of farming Soul Cinders to meet that 1650 requirement. By consequence, that's also going to get you 8,240 Soul Ash. So it actually doesn't matter if you want to make one from scratch or upgrade a rank 4 to a rank 6, you're going to have enough to make a brand new legendary anyway. You're still going to have to get what you need to make those base pieces, and well, you're going to have enough to make a new legendary anyway. Let's step this down to the rank 5s, which are a lot cheaper. In this case, to get a rank 5, you only need one week's worth of farming soul cinders and need to pony up another 3,000 soul ash, making this complaint a little bit more reasonable if you don't already have this ash. However, we can't forget about the requirements to make rank 6s, so it's pretty much inevitable that you'll end up stockpiling tons and tons of soul ash to a point where trading it to other alts is definitely a good idea. Before that becomes moot and they'll be swimming in soul ash as well. The takeaway is that one, it'll be really easy to make rank 4 legendaries now, causing the market for rank 4 legendary base pieces to totally spike. But also, in spite of our complaining over recrafting the same legendaries thanks to the way upgrades work, our player behavior won't even change. So if there was a way to disenchant legendaries to get soul ash back, it's gonna feel meaningless because we would still be buried in ash while farming for these cinders. And now we just disenchanted our legendary for nothing, really. I'm sure we can think up a different sort of complaint, but those are my thoughts on legendaries. 
And that's kind of it. That's what gearing in 9.1 is going to kind of be like. I know this came off kind of weird because there are different paths to gearing that do cross over at certain levels of play, but for the most part, 9.1 is giving a little bit to everybody, and I think that's pretty cool. So that's going to be it for this guide. Please leave your thoughts in a comment below, subscribe for more guides and content and other such things, and we'll see you later. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay breezy.